So thank you very much. Thank you, Brittany, for that. Thank you, Sean, for the battery as well. Either way, let's pray real quick. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the awesome God you are. We thank you for our children, Father. And we look to your word as the Spirit teaches us through it. And we just want to uplift our children and even the parents that are raising them at this time and grandparents and and every single one of us, um, even if we don't have children or they're out of the house, um, we can have such an impact and influence on all of our kids here and even the kids we run into. And we have uh, so many teachers here. And I think of all the, the, the kids they run into daily and uh, how they can just be a light uh, to them. So, Father, we thank you for our kids club and uh, we look forward to our time in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6. Chapter 6. And just perfectly worked out this way that we'll be talking about children today. Interesting. It's how God works things out. But either way, uh, I labeled, titled it, The Arrow. But Ephesians 6, 1 to 4 will be in there today. And then... Also, a little bit of Psalm 127, 3 and 5, so you can pre-mark that for later if you want. But I do want to start things off, though, um, in a way, just to address some things. Um, last couple of messages, obviously, dealing, going through the book of Ephesians, have been focused on marriage and God's design for it. God desires a spirit-filled marriage. But the question is, what if you're not married, right? Or what if... What, what's for you in this? Well, beginning of chapter 5, it starts off, Be ye therefore followers of God as what? Dear children. He starts it off with that in verse 1. He desires for all members of the body of Christ to be filled with the Spirit. God's dealing in this section right now. Yes, He's dealing with marriage. He's going to deal with children. But don't forget that God also desires to, you know, the individual who's not married to be a light of the world, to be His ambassador. Okay, And at the same time, Paul also states in 1 Corinthians 7, he talks about marriage and things like that, but Paul says that it's a gift from God to not to be married. Okay, it's a gift from God. He actually says in 1 Corinthians 7, why don't you turn there real quick. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. This one I address this real quick. Don't want to feel like I'm leaving anyone out. But 1 Corinthians 7, 7, he says this to us as individuals, as born-again believers. He says, 1 Corinthians 7, 7, For I would that all men were even as myself, Paul is addressing about himself here. But every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner, another after that. And I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as what? As I. Paul was not married at the time. Okay? And he says, you can stay as I am. And when you read the passage along, you see the idea is that God was able to use Paul mightily, where in sense if he had a wife or had children, he still uses them mightily, but Paul's got to focus more on who? His wife and his children. And so it's a gift from God, you see that in 1 Corinthians 7, to actually be, to not be married. Because you can focus totally on what God wants for you and not worry about your wife or your kids in that sense. Because but it's a gift from God. I just want to address that real quick. And his, his desire is that you use that gift and be filled with the Spirit, in which exactly what this whole chapter 5 is dealing with. Pastor Stewart's been talking about it as well, being filled with the Spirit. In 5.18, be not drunk with wine, wearing his excess, but be filled with the Spirit. He, that's his desire for you and I as individuals. Go back to Ephesians 6. But I just want to kind of address that real quick as well. I'm not leaving you hanging. God's desire is that we all, as followers of God, be, you know, walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us and offering Cyrus to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But today we'll be continuing as we go through Ephesians, chapter 6. We're going to continue with the focus on the family and God's Word. And God has the blueprint, as I like to say, on how the family is to function. 
And God is literally giving something special here. Listen up, parents. He's giving something very special to all parents in this chapter alone. Verse 1. It's something that all parents want from their children. Something all parents want. They want children to what? Listen. In a lot of ways, we have Kids Club. We have our... Uh, Brittany was just listing all the, end of help, the helpers and things. The one thing that they want the kids to do is to what? Listen. That's our desire. Well, God just gives us, just boom, He gives us a gift right here in verse 1. Ready? Let's read it together. Children. Who's it addressing? Children, yeah. Obey your parents. Now, we already know who that... It's addressing children of parents. So, these are kids... Okay, he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. God desires the family to function properly the way he wants it, and he gives parents a gift. He tells the kids to listen. And so literally he says to parents, here you go. You can tell your kids that they have to listen because I said it. Listen to your parents. Children, obey your parents. The word obey literally means to hear under. It simply means that children are to learn to obey voice commands from their parents. And obviously, the earlier the what? Better, right? The earlier you teach this to any child is it, what? They, it, it's the best way. Uh, but if you haven't started, today's a good day to start. Uh, but either way, obviously, the earlier this kind of obedience is enforced, the better results. Uh, now, again, you don't have to be a parent to know this, but newsflash, kids study who? Adults, right? Kids study adults, and they know how long or how far they can push the what? The red button. Because every parent... Every person who helps out with kids and every preschool teacher in the back there with Miss Vicky, they all have red buttons. Grandparents have red buttons. Okay? Everybody has a red button. And, and kids, because they study us so well, they know how to push those buttons. Okay? And so they, they know how, where to push it. And it's like they don't, they really know when your final no, it means no, right? It's like, no. No, I meant no. I meant no. I really meant no, right? Okay, I'm done, right? Well, I won't call any kids out here. I won't call even Travis out. Uh, but I'll just use Liz and I and our kids as an example, okay? I'll just use us. We obviously have four, four children. Each of them are fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalms 139, I'm going to just point this out. I love my children. I pick on them, but I love them. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy words, and that my soul knoweth right well. And I tell my children that all the time. We, t we try to emphasize that they're created in the image of God, that we love them. God loves them. Okay, so we establish that. But there's four of them, right? And every kid is unique, and every one of my kids is unique. Every no means different to them. Okay, that's why we named Nolan No-No. Okay, but either way, <laughs> they also study the rest of the family, though, all my children. They, they study every single one of them. And it's interesting. They all, they all have a high respect for my mom, their grandmother. They all have a high respect. Now, I'll give you a, a good example of this. One day, Liz and I dropped the kids off to her mom's place. We get back after you know, a couple hours, and her mom was like, Hey, what does your mom have on the kids? What are you talking about? Well, what's, what does she have on Nolan? Oh, well, I don't know. What do you mean? Well, he was acting up, and I was just like, hey, Nolan, calm down. Nolan, sit down. And she does art things with him. She's painting with him, and he's, you know, got the paint going. He's going all crazy. And, and all of a sudden, she just said, Ava just looks right at him and says, we're going to tell Grandma Penny. And he just stopped. <laughs> Puts the paint down. And she says, what does she have on him? What does she have on him? Well, it's 2 Corinthians, and we can all learn from it. And I, I, a lot of us joke about it, but we always say maybe it's the perfume she's wearing. I don't know. Uh, but the 2 Corinthians 7, go there real quick with me. 2 Corinthians, yeah, 7. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 17 and 18. 
17 and 18. Kids like to push buttons, and they, they, they know, they study us. So either way, first, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 18 and 19, 17 and 18. There we go. I'll spit it out there finally for you. Because when I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? That with me there should be what? Yea, yea, and nay, nay. But as God is true, our word toward you, toward you was not yea or nay for the Son of God. God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was what? Yea. You get the idea that no means no, and yes means what? Yes. Well, you get the idea with my mother, I knew where I stood with her. No meant no. So I went to my father. Dad, what, about, what do you think about this? But the kids know that. They study us. That's my point. Kids are studying our actions. They know who to go to. They know how far to push the buttons. And they'll keep pushing until they get their what? Their way. But it says, children, obey the, your parents in the Lord. And the one thing is that you've got you to gotta be, you know, your no's have to mean no. And kids know that. And, but the, if you're, you know, you let them get their own way, they're going to get their own way what? Their entire life. But verse 1, though, says, and this is where you guys say, hey, you're to, you're to obey your parents here. I said no. God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children should be trained, okay, to hear and obey on the first command. That's what God says here, on the first command. It, it may actually save their lives one day. Did you know that? that? That's a good teaching that we can tell our children. Why, you know... I'm saying no or I say yes because I do. I love you. Give you guidelines. Here, you know, it could save their life one day. And to give you a good example of this, we were in Wisconsin and we had a, a church picnic one time and a young gal left the, the church picnic earlier. And the kids, we got a lot of kids out there and the kids were running around and I've just around the bonfire and I looked and I see a car coming, and I see the kids going across the road, and I see Yvonne is in the back of the line, right? And I'm like, uh-oh, that car's coming. She's in the back of the line. And then she went backwards onto the road again. But when she went to turn, and it was like this close, she heard her dad's voice go, no! She knew my final no. <laughs> and she stopped. And it saved her life. Gave me more gray hairs, and I think I'm becoming bald in the back now. But the fact is, kids, when you, you try to express to them, I love you, this is why I say no, this is why I say, these, this is why there's rules, because you care for their safety. You care for them. And it actually saves their lives. And as the older they get, and the more they're around other kids, it actually, the guidance from the parents or from leaders, or from grandparents, it can save much heartache later in life. If you've never read the book of Proverbs, I really want you to read the book of Proverbs sometime. Go to the book of Proverbs chapter 1 real quick. We don't have the time to go through King Solomon's life, but we know he was a good king at first, and then he ended up straying a little bit, obviously, and he was led down the wrong path. But he wrote the book of Proverbs to his sons. Okay. He wrote the book of Proverbs to his sons, and he was giving warning, guidelines, almost, don't do what I did. Okay, From experience, don't do it. But he says this in Proverbs 1, verse 5. And this is a lesson for us all. Proverbs 1, verse 5. A wise man will hear and will increase in what? Learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto who? Wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and the dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is, to be, is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains upon, about thy neck. My son... If sinners entice thee, consent thou what? Not. 
And he, as you continue to read, it's just a fabulous book. Go back to Ephesians. a fabulous book to go through. Uh, but he's warning his sons, and he's warning them from individuals coming alongside them and giving them heartache. What a tremendous thing to go alongside our children to know that you got their back, that you care for them, you care for their heart, and them as well, their being, you can give them some guidelines. It's something that all parents, Ephesians 6, 1, is something that all parents want for their children. They just want them to listen to them. So, children, I'm telling you, Emmeline, Sophia, Joey, myself, I guess. No. <laughs> listen to your parents. We should have had all the kids in here first. Why did they go back to junior church? This was for them, not for you. Listen to your parents. In the Lord, though, it says. In the Lord. See, children play a role in God's agenda. Did you know that? They play a role in God's agenda. You are to submit to your parents' legitimate authority because your obedience is in the Lord. In the Lord. Children are to respond to parents out of their response to God because parents are to lead them in the ways of God. Doing so is right. That's why it says, for this is right. Unless the parents contradict God, children are to obey them. So kids, you're to listen and then you're to honor your parents. Verse 2, it continues on. Now don't worry. We'll get to the parents here shortly. It says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. To honor something means to, to fix a value on it. Honoring parents mean that Children must come to recognize the value of their parents and treat them accordingly. Honor goes a step beyond obedience. Honoring parents means that children must come to recognize the value of their parents and treat them accordingly. Honoring parents is a lifelong activity. It's not just when you're a child. It, it, you're honoring your parents throughout your life. It extends to when they even passed away. Living a life that upholds the family name is a wonderful honor to bestow upon parents. Proverbs 10.1, another proverb for you. The Proverbs of Solomon, a wise son maketh a what? Glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of who? Of his mother. Now, you to obey your parents, listen to them, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. And then in verse 3, the results. Now the results for this is verse 3. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. The results of obeying of parents, listening to them, the results of honoring them, Respecting that they are your parents is that you'll have a good life and you live longer on earth. And yes, bad things do happen to people, but we know God works all things together for good. Romans 8, 28 tells us that. But the rule of thumb, according to God's word for children, is for you to listen to your parents about what is right and wrong. You'll live longer. Meaning when the parent says, stay off the street, don't play on it. What's the advantage of that? You won't get hit by a car. Right? Drugs. Telling your children about drugs. The worldly system that we're in. To instruct children to stay morally pure. It all tends to live, tends to a long life. Now, God wants parents to aim their child's, child's heart to God. Okay? That's his desire. God has the blue, blueprint to do this. First and foremost, he tells children to listen and honor your parents. And as I say that, when you read the first three verses, all the parents are probably lifting up their holy hands right now and saying, Amen. Praise God. Listen to me, son. Listen to me, daughter. But can I tell you something? If you desire this, because I desire this, I want my children to listen to me. Do you know it all starts with the Father? It all starts 
with the Father. Read verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to what? Wrath. But bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. As the head, to explain. As the head of the family, the leader of the family, a a father has primary responsibility for raising his children. Of course, not leaving any mothers out. Mothers are not excluded from responsibility. Children are called to obey who? Mother and father. Okay, they're called to obey and honor both. But the father has the ultimate responsibility. We just went over God's design and blueprint for the marriage. Husbands are to love their wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He's the head of the family. He has a responsibility, a huge responsibility. And it starts with the father. He, it tells you right away, don't provoke the children. That means to rouse, to wrath, to provoke, exasperate, or to anger. Don't stir up anger in your children. He says that. God says that to us fathers, myself included. Instead of getting them angry or stirring the pot, be an encourager. Not a discourager. Okay, in other words, what I mean by uh, correct, not provoking and anger is also don't correct your kids in such a way that they can become embittered, so angry. You can discipline children when they become so angry at you and they'll never listen to you. Instead, be an encourager. And you fathers provoke not your children to wrath. Encourage them. Praise them and make sure they know you are proud to be their dad. Tell them. Just like your wife needs to hear from you that you love her, your children need to hear the same thing. That you love them. That you're proud of them. That you're proud that God made them for who they are. Every child is different. I got four of them. I can name you different things about each kid. And I love them Every single one of them. And I tell them that every single day. But they're all different. They function different. They have different gifts. That's okay. God made them that way. We're to encourage our children. Okay? To be a proud dad. Nothing's better for a kid to know that your dad is proud of you. I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of your daughter. Now, do you dads know, here's a question, there's a question for myself as well. Do you dads know your children's love language? You love your child, but does your child feel loved? There's a great book by Gary Chapman. I actually have it right here. It's called The Five Love Languages. It's a tremendous book for children. Okay, five languages of children. There's five love languages for adults, and children are what? Human beings, they have feelings as well. Okay, we're to focus on them, but every kid feels love differently. Some kids like words of affirmation. Some likes acts of service, receiving gifts. That's a tough one. If you're one of those parents that the kid likes to receive gifts, watch out. Get a mortgage out, that with your gas loan too. A little bit of quality time. Kids like quality time. And they like physical touch. They literally like hugs. They like a kiss goodnight. I love you. Praying with them. And actually one of the best, the best ways to love your children is to love your spouse. That's the best way. That's the first thing. Your spouse, your loved one. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, love your husbands. First, nothing speaks love to a child. Because children are watching our very step. They know the buttons to push, right? They know how far to push us. Well, how do they know that? Because they watch us. They watch how we interact with each other. Okay? And so they're sensitive. Their feelings are very, they're very sensitive. And they will sense the love and they will sense the issues. Just like when you walk into a hot room, right? And you're like, in a hot room's not like the summit, sauna, or something like that. No, like when there's a heated discussion, and you're not even in there, right? But you just walk in, and you see a couple people talking, and you're like, ooh, a little hot in here. 
I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do I do here? Kids sense that. They know. They, they know when stuff is going on. Okay? So it starts with the father. Fathers, love your wives. Okay? And uh, first and foremost, moms, wives, you, you play such an important part in this as well. Okay? You have a, a huge important part. You are your husband's co-warrior, companion, helper, and you need to also know these love languages for your kids. And Liz and I talk about it sometimes when there's some issues going on, a kid's got a bad attitude or what have you, and something's going on with him. What, and it's not, what's, he, what's wrong with him? We, no, it's, what are we doing? What's going on? What, what are we talking about? You know, kids sense these things. They send stress in my life. They send stress in my wife's life. They send stress in the grandparents' lives. And I'm not leaving grandparents out here or friends and things like that. There are certain conversations that we do not need to have in what? In front of who? Children. You know, the one common thing is, where are all the people in church? Where are all the young people? Right? Well, I, I heard from a friend before that I don't go to church because I heard too much junk at home about church. Just gossip the whole time. Just to, you know, why would I go to church if people don't like people at church? Right? Kids hear it. And even though the parent didn't really mean it, they're just, they're just venting, right? They're just venting. We have to watch how we vent. We, we have to watch when our children are in front of us. They sense it. And their feelings, they, they get up, up tight. Okay? And sometimes they act out. Okay, but it all starts with the, fa the you, know, you want your parent, you want the children to listen, you want them to honor you, you want to, them to honor you as parents, you want them to respect you as parents, respect me. It starts with the father, it starts with the family. Okay, it's a big job. I'm not making fun of every single one, every, every father or husband or grandfather here. I'm picking on myself as well. It's a big job. But God's given it to the Father to be the spiritual leader and to suck it up and take ownership. And so that's what we're to do. And wives, you're to encourage us to do it. You're to encourage. Love your husband first. Encourage your husband to lead you and your kids. Also, fathers, don't provoke your children, but bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. Verse 4 says it. Bring them up in nurture and admonition of the Lord. And bring them up means to nurture to maturity. Okay? God placed the responsibility to raise up children squarely on the shoulders. The shoulders. Shoulders. I can't even pronounce my words. Soldiers. Christian shoulders. You want to prepare them to be a shoulder. But uh, it's on the parents. They're your kids. Right? They're not my... I mean, my kids are my kids. They're not my mom and dad's kids, are they? They're, they're the grandparents. But I'm the dad. They're my kids. Liz is the what? Liz is the mom. She, not my mom. She's the grandmother. Her parents are not the parents. We're the parents. It's our responsibility to raise them. God doesn't say in this verse, yin ye grandfathers. Well, that's interesting. No, he says, ye fathers, okay? You're to raise them up. He places the, responsi the responsibility strictly on the parents. They're your kids or kids. And they're from the Lord, though. I want to say that. An admonition of the Lord. They're from the Lord. Own and take care of them. But the question is how? Well, he tells you how. Nurture and admonition of the Lord. You were to be training. Training our children. Training and instruction has to do with teaching and discipline. God has given fathers the, primarily, the primary biblical role for childbearing, and they should teach kids divine, God's divine guidelines on their own level and even break it down in such a way that they can grasp it. And I'll give you an example of this. We're at baseball. Blake is in baseball practice, and he's never bunted before. You know, he's never bunted. And we're doing, and he's in there, he's in there. You got like 12 kids, you know, they're in line. And I can see him, he's kind of like, 
you know, he's just doing it. So I go over and I, I try to break it down for him, right? I said, Blake, it's, it's a bunt. You just get ready and get, and he, Dad. And I said, like, Blake, you need to calm down if you want to learn how to bunt, okay? And then he teaches him a bunt. And then he just gets in the batting cage and boom, he bunts a ball down. And then he gets confident, right? And I said, like, I'm a proud dad. I taught him that, right? No, I encouraged him then after that, by the way. I said, keep doing it. But you had to break it down. Sometimes kids need things broken down. Us adults, we see certain things and we're like, oh, that makes sense, right? And then when you're driving on a road with kids and they see a sign, they're like, what's that sign mean, Dad? Well, it means this. Well, I don't understand. Okay, well, it means this. I don't understand. Liz, can you help them, please? I don't know how to break this down. The kids need things broken down, okay? We need to break things down for kids, break it down in their own level, level so they can grasp it. And what I mean by that, we must give them age-appropriate discipline as well. You don't see my father taking me on, my knee, on his knee and spanking me, do you? No, because it's inappropriate. And if you do, you better let them know not to do it. <laughs> no, it's inappropriate. Every kid's different. Every age is different. Every kid receives a different discipline. Every kid receives a different discipline. Every kid functions differently. I can look at Ava and say, Ava, and she just melts down and cries. Right? I can look at Blake and he gives him that face. And I said, Blake, I'm telling you, time out works best for Blake. Right? Ivana, I don't know what it works for Ivana yet. I'm still working on that one. I'm still working on Ivana. And Nolan, it's candy. No candy for you, bud. <gasps> what? Are you kidding me? And thanks, Paul, for the gummy worm, by the way, for him. But either, every kid's different, so I'm trying to get at. All of our kids that are up here, they're all different. They all function differently. They all listen differently. We're not, I mean, you can't just treat the, same, the kid the same way. I mean, are you the same as your spouse? Are you the same as your next-door neighbor? Are you the same as me? No, you're not may have similar qualities or something like that, but you're different. And you listen different. You know, you're, you're to listen, but, you know, discipline is, is it's, it's all about age appropriate. I mean, and one thing is when we discipline our children, men, fathers, and mothers, we're not to do it in anger. Do not discipline your children in anger. We're to discipline and love. Sometimes you just got to walk away for a couple seconds. You got to walk away. If it's in anger, it will lead to physical abuse. It will lead to that. And you have a greater chance of not raising your children in the Lord. You have a greater chance of your children not listening to verses 1 and 2. Discipline should be done in love. And a a great verse, for an example, is Abraham. And God had ears talking to him. But if I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God knew how Abraham was going to raise his household. Okay? He knew how he was going to raise his household. God knew that. It's a great verse for us, 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 family, you know, us fathers, for one. But God knows that. God knows that, knew that for Abraham. His household after what? Him. He's not, it, the idea I'm getting at is that Abraham wasn't just focused on himself. Understand that? As fathers, you can't just be focused on yourselves. When you're the head of the family, the spiritual leader of your family, you're not focused on yourself. You're focused on who? Your family. God's given your God's gift to you is your family. And God wants you to raise your children in the Lord. God wants that for you and I. Great, great verse there. He wants parents to aim their child's heart to God. The purpose. He doesn't want you to just go off in the world, son, and let everybody else teach you. Guess who's going to be teaching them in the world? Satan. He's the prince and power of the air, and we fight a spiritual warfare, and it's real. The world will grasp our kids and toss them around. It's wicked out there. God has a blueprint to do this for parents, though. 
He tells children to listen, honor your parents, and as parents are lifting up their holy hands right now and saying amen again, because that's what we want, it starts with the Father, and it's very critical for parents to know how to raise our children. Very critical. But why does it matter to raise our... Why does it matter? You could ask that question. Why does it matter to raise our children the right way, right? Why does it matter? What's the deal? Why does it matter? Well, God says one. This is what he wants. God says. But the answer is very simple. Because one day, your children are going to leave the house. They're going to leave the house and be in the world someday. And God's word is very clear that he wants this arrow. He wants us to let this arrow Fly And the arrows are speaking about our children. Go to Psalm 127, verses 3. Psalm 127. It's kind of like when you get a, fir- a, a new job, right? <laughs> and someone typically trains you to do that job. Sometimes. Not all the time, but sometimes. It's nice to be trained the right way, right? Because once the trainer is done training you, what happens? They let you go, right? And then you're on your own. And then things kind of hit, and they're like, I don't know what to do. When your kids leave the, wor- leave the house, no underneath mommy and daddy, what happens? If you didn't teach them the right way, what happens? They start living like the world. Or sometimes they start scrambling. God wants us to prepare our children to fly. Let that arrow fly. Don't, don't hold them back. Psalm 127, verse 3, and five, 3 to 5. He says, Lo, the children are a heritage of the Lord, and the fruit in the womb is what? His reward. As arrows are in the hand of, the mighty, of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They, are, they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Verse 3 tells us children are intended to be received and valued as a gift from the Lord, a reward. They should be received as a wonderful inheritance. They should, re- they should receive care and training. That's the nurture and admonition. And verse 4 tells us arrows are meant to fly at a target. We are ambassadors for Christ. Raise your children in the Lord and let them fly in the Lord. Encourage them to do what the Lord is leading them to do. Don't discourage them. Don't discourage them from not wanting to be, wanting to be a missionary. Don't discourage them from being a pastor or a pastor's wife or getting involved with church. Don't discourage them from being a teacher, or being an engineer, a contractor, a coffee maker. Web designer or a stay-at-home mom. Don't discourage somebody from those things. Don't discourage them from doing their own business because that's what the Lord is leading them to do. Encourage them to do it. You did your part. You had your chance to raise them up in the Lord. They're now entering into the world. They got God on their side. You need to encourage them. Encourage them to do it. Let the Lord lead them. Encourage them by praying for them. And just have a listening ear for them. And fathers, happy you are. Put a smile on, Travis. Put a smile on myself as well. You get grumpy sometimes in the morning. My kids wake me up. What are you doing? He says, happy you are, it says. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are the children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Happy you are when your quiver is full of arrows. And the quiver is indeed the the case for carrying arrows, by the way. Great illustration. But happy you are when your children are serving the Lord in whatever the Lord leads them to do. God wants parents to aim their children's hearts to God. He has the blueprint to do this. He tells children to listen to the parents, to honor their parents. 
And as all parents are lifting their hands up and saying, Praise God, I love these first two and three verses. It all starts with the family. It starts with the father and the mother. And it's very critical for parents to know how to raise our children. And the question is, like I said, why does it matter? Because one day, we have to let the arrow fly. We have to let our children go. We have to let them go on in the world, be God's amb- the ambassador God has called them to be. Be a living testimony wherever God has called them to do it, to encourage them to do it. And I'm going to tell you right now, in Psalm 127, verse 5, happy you will be when you see them flying like arrows for the Lord. Don't be scared when God takes our children. Because God's going to use our children for a mighty way. That's a